All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, if anyone can't hear me, just let me know. Um, and if I'm talking too fast or you have a question, just raise your hand and we can go ahead and stop. Um, so sort of an informal lecture. Um, my name is Jessica Nielsen. I'm an assistant professor here at the university. And I'm trying to develop a, a new course about psychedelic neuroscience. So I'm piloting some content for the public just to try and work out what kind of ideas I would want to put into the course and see how people respond to it and get some feedback. Um, so this is sort of a, a rough draft of this. So um, thanks for coming and sort of uh, listening to what I have to say. Um, so um, I'm also the founder of the Psychedelic Society of Minneapolis. And so a lot of the content I'll be talking about, or maybe not a lot of the content, but some of the content will be um, related to the society and some of the things we'll be doing. But for the most part, I'm going to be talking about the therapeutic applications of entheogenic plants and fungi. And for anybody in the room that's a, um, an LPC or an LPCC, um, if you're a clinician and you have one of those licenses, we are approved by the uh, Minnesota Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy to offer one unit of continuing education. So if you're interested in getting that credit, uh, just send me an email afterwards. And I have a slide at the end with my email address if you want uh, to get credit for that. OK. So just a, a disclaimer before I get started. Um, let's see. So um, the information presented here is not intended or implied intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment recommendations. All content, including text, graphics, images, and information contained on or available through this talk is for educational purposes only. Please contact your physician to form a plan that addresses you or your loved one's specific needs. Uh, we do have a list of current clinical trials using psychedelics and, and other kind of psychoactive compounds that are being done in the United States as well as abroad. Um, and so you can find those on the Psychedelic Society website, uh, which I have linked there. Um, if you are interested in becoming a participant in a clinical trial, um, you should know that clinical trials are not designed to be treatments for specific conditions. They're actually more um, designed for research purposes, like a science experiment, and they're only to determine mechanisms, safety, and tolerability, and any potential therapeutic efficacy for an experimental drug that they're trying to push through to get um, FDA approval for. So the screening and inclusion criteria can be very strict, and it can be difficult to be selected and be eligible for enrollment into a study. And being involved in a clinical trial does not guarantee any benefit from the treatment, and being a participant in a clinical trial can be very time, time, time sensitive or time intensive because sometimes they can last up to a year, depending on the aims of the study. Um, but for access to resources about other um, legal experiences out around in the country. Um, we also have a list of those on the Psychedelic Society website. So certain psychedelics aren't illegal everywhere. Um, so like if you go to Amsterdam, you can uh, take psilocybin truffles, for example. Jamaica has decriminalized psilocybin, so there's a, a retreat center down there. Um, ayahuasca is legal in South America. Um, and I'll go into sort of some of the therapeutic potential of some of those, but just keep that in mind. Um, but currently in the United States, these compounds are Schedule I drugs, and the only accepted use of them um, in a legal setting is in an FDA, DEA approved clinical trial. Um, and also the final caveat and disclaimer is that I am a neuroscientist. I'm not a clinician or a medical doctor, so just keep that in mind as I describe any of this information and know that I don't have any formal medical training. Okay, so the learning objectives for today, uh, we have several. So uh, the first is um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll um, be able to know the history of psychedelics. Um, also to understand objective and subjective effects of psychedelics, being able to identify common psychedelics, know the therapeutic and healing uses of common psychedelics, and be aware of current research with psychedelics. So just a brief overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so first, I'm just kind of going to give you a brief overview. What are entheogens? I'm not sure. How many people in the room have heard of the term entheogen? Okay. How many of you have heard of psychedelics? All right, almost everyone. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the history of clinical research on natural and synthetic psychedelics and the war on drugs. Uh, then I'll follow that up with the current renaissance of clinical trials with entheogenic plants and fungi. And then I'll close out with some efforts that we have locally to decriminalize uh, these plants and fungi, as well as some clinical research that's going to be starting up in the spring here at the university. 
So what are entheogens? Um, so entheogens are a class of psychoactive, psychoactive substances that induce any type of spiritual experience aimed at development or sacred use. The term entheogen is often chosen to contrast recreational use of the same drugs. The religious, shamanic, or spiritual significance of entheogens is well established in anthropological and modern contexts. And entheogens have traditionally been used to supplement many diverse practices geared towards achieving transcendence, including white and black magic, divination, meditation, yoga, sensory deprivation, asceticism, prayer, trance, rituals, chanting, hymns, um, and things like that, including uh, peyote songs and drumming, and um, also ikaros that are used um, with ayahuasca religions. So some of the common entheogens that um, I'll be talking about today include uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms, like magic mushrooms, we typically call them in, on the street, um, ayahuasca, which is actually an admixture of two different plants, um, ibogaine, and mescaline-containing cacti, like peyote and San Pedro. So the history of entheogens. So entheogenic plants and fungi are central to ritualistic and traditional medicinal practices in indigenous cultures worldwide. And civilizations have used entheogens for thousands of years. Um, uh, they've been depicted in cave art for a very long time, and cultures have used them for healing and spiritual purposes, as well as a way to gain wisdom and guidance. So they were first popularized in Western cultures in the 1960s, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of them, like psilocybin and peyote, um, became Schedule One substances in the 1970s after the war on drugs started um, with the introduction of the Controlled Substances Act by um, President Nixon at the time. Um, but fortunately, there's been a recent revival in psychedelic research, um, including um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, granting breakthrough therapy designation for psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. So one of the, the most difficult things about psychedelics is the fact that the word psychedelic itself is highly stigmatized, and that came a lot from the propaganda following the war on drugs in the 1970s. Um, but just a little bit of uh, history about where this term came from for those that aren't familiar. So it was first, the idea of this, they were trying to coin a term, this, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, phenerothymy. Um, it's from the Greek feigning to reveal and thymos mind soul. So to reveal the mind or the soul. And this was coined by the British writer Aldous, Aldous Huxley to describe the effect of mind altering drugs such as LSD. He first used the term in a letter that he wrote to Humphrey Osmond who counterproposed that the term psychedelic be used uh, as sort of a mind revealing or mind manifesting. And so some of the, the two famous terms that I have quoted up here uh, that they're both sort of known for, uh, Aldous Huxley said, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of funeral thyme. Uh, and then Humphrey Osmond coined the term, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. Which can be true for anyone that's tried it. All right. Um, unfortunately, did you have a question? Um, the funny word that we're struggling to say, it's very similar to phenethylamine. Okay. I, I'm just curious, like hypothesizing, does that have any specific? Is half a gram of mescaline would be about right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm assuming it's it, the last word is time because it's supposed to rhyme with sublime. Mm -hmm. So phenero, thyme, 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 not quite sure. Does anybody know? Anybody heard this word? I, this is the, my first time uh, seeing this word, actually. I mean, in, in putting this talk together. Okay. So um, following the birth of the hippie counterculture movement in the 1960s, President Nixon initiated the war on drugs uh, with the creation of the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, uh, with a major emphasis on marijuana and psychedelics that disproportionately targeted the hippie counterculture and people of color. Um, and this was unfortunate because at the time there was a lot of scientific research happening, uh, mostly in the field of psychiatry, where they were using things like um, LSD and psilocybin and mescaline to understand how the mind works and to understand basic pharmacology of, of the brain, um, and also as a way to potentially understand psychosis in some of their patients. And unfortunately, all of that research was not considered valid at the time, and the FDA didn't consider it to be credible scientific evidence. And so when the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970, they made them all Schedule I drugs. And the definition of a Schedule I drug is that it has a high potential for abuse and harm, and it has no therapeutic 
benefit. Even though there were thousands of clinical research studies happening at the time, they basically set all of the regulations and requirements for what you would consider to be therapeutic evidence basically against all the evidence that they currently had. So none of it was admissible, which was really unfortunate. Um, let's see. So, as you can imagine, the war on drugs has been a massive failure by the government. Uh, they spent billions of dollars and unnecessary resources over the past couple decades um, towards incarceration for drug offenders, perpetuating significant harm to marginalized communities that are disproportionately targeted. And the idea of the war on drugs is interesting because um, for those of you who know Dennis McKenna, he would point out um, that it's really more of a war of drugs um, because if you think about um, all of the things that we consider to be legal and acceptable therapy, some of the currently approved drugs are actually a little bit more harmful uh, than maybe some of these psychedelics. So it seems like there's a sort of war about what is and is it beneficial. So it's kind of like this war between different classes of drugs and what we deem acceptable. So we have the government saying you can't take LSD or psilocybin or mescaline, but at the same time they're pushing other legal or prescription drugs. Um, you know, like Adderall to children and things like that, which kind of has mixed reviews. Um, and I won't go on a tangent about that, but I have my own opinions about that. Um, and unfortunately, like I alluded to before, the um, other area that the war on drugs has impacted is scientific research into their mechanisms and therapeutic potential. So like I said, in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of research being done um, with LSD and psilocybin and mescaline. So this first graph is showing general trends that I looked up on PubMed, which is sort of our public library of medicine that will index all the different publications for scientific literature for as long as we can index them. Um, and so this shows the data from 1950 until about 2017. And um, if you cross each term with the word therapy, we see similar trends. Um, however, there's fewer articles because there's a lot, of, a lot of science was being done just to um, research their harm. Um, but the graph, uh, I mean, you can kind of see that there's, there's a lot of research that was being done, but you can kind of see this stark sort of drop in the research around that time that the Controlled Substance Act started because it basically made anyone trying to do research a criminal. You couldn't access them. You couldn't keep them in your lab. You couldn't administer them to people, and you obviously couldn't possess them or use them uh, for recreational or spiritual uses. Um, but fortunately, over the years, we have started to see more of an uptick and um, more, more research being focused on this. And there is sort of an overrepresentation of marijuana and ketamine marijuana, just because there's a lot of research focused again on trying to look at what, how it's harmful. Does it hurt kids? Is it inducing psychosis? There's a, a lot of attention being paid to this and, and the literature is just all over the place when it comes to marijuana. Um, and then ketamine is actually a very widely used anesthetic. So there's a lot of research being done that's not really related to therapeutic potential, but more about how it's used um, in anesthesiology. But obviously, there's changes in that for people that are aware of ketamine's uh, recent um, success in treating depression. Um, and you can't really see some of the other psychedelics here just because of the, the scale bars, obviously. Um, it's kind of blown out here. Um, so I just wanted to go through each drug on their own where you can actually see the, the numbers for each drug and see their trends over time. Um, so. There was a lot of research about LSD and mescaline, like I said before, and psilocybin. But unfortunately, after the war on drugs started, uh, that research has never really recovered. People have not really started to use LSD again. There are a few people doing it, but it's just not to the level that it once was. Um, and mescaline research is almost non-existent these days, um, at least um, in the context of clinical trials and, and whatnot. There are some observational studies in Native American populations, but it's, it's very minimal. Um, psilocybin, fortunately, is gaining a lot of attention. There's a lot of uh, research focused on looking at psilocybin. And you obviously see the increase in uh, research into MDMA, um, as well as iboga and ayahuasca kind of just starting to gain momentum after the turn of the century. Okay. So fortunately, the evidence and the research late, um, with the psychedelic renaissance is building. So popular press and scientific literature are hailing psychedelics, MDMA, and marijuana as the new medical breakthrough for a variety of conditions. And more research is needed to truly understand their potential risks and benefits and mechanisms of action. And of course, the widely successful book by Michael Pollan uh, has been so helpful in bringing this more into the mainstream and helping to lend some credibility to these potential therapies for mental health disorders, which has been really great. A lot of people who maybe never heard of psychedelics or didn't even know that these things were being researched in clinical settings are now 
very much aware of this and really getting turned on to um, the potential of these um, medicines to treat various disorders. Um, and then recently, um, there's been two clinical trials to look at treatment-resistant depression that have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA. The first is a European clinical trial. They do have some sites in the United States. It's run by this group called Compass Pathways. They're actually a for-profit pharmaceutical company that I personally may not want to bash them, but they kind of have a more profit motive agenda, like your typical pharmaceutical company. Um, but there's another... Um, really great company called USONA, which is based out of Madison, Wisconsin, and they also received FDA breakthrough th their therapy designation for their clinical trial of psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, so this is just sort of my psychedelic nerd <laughs> um, nod to um, Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but there is a new hope. Uh, so there's lots of organizations popping up all over the country, like the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Who here has heard of them? Okay, fair number of people. Uh, so they were founded in the 80s, right after MDMA was made illegal by the DEA after the rave culture got a hold of it. Um, and so their founder, Rick Doblin, has been working tirelessly for the past 30 years trying to get MDMA off the Schedule One list and um, shown and rescheduled into Schedule Two so it could be prescribed as a therapy for treat for um, PTSD. There's the Hefter Research Institute, which is primarily focused on uh, psilocybin research. Beckley Foundation, which is based in the UK, and they fund a lot of the really interesting mechanistic research that's happening out of University College London and some other sites in Europe. Um, they were founded by um, Amanda Fielding, who is this really interesting, she's a countess or something, some kind of, you know, aristocratic British woman who's, you know, she was very into LSD in the 60s, and she's kind of made it her life's goal to really push this forward and get it, um, get it approved and reduce the stigma and, and, and fund more research um, in the UK, where they actually seem to be a lot stricter about their research than we are here. Uh, there's great conferences that are happening related to psychedelic science. So there's actually a conference called Psychedelic Science. There's been about four of these since 2010 that's put on by MAPS. Um, there's training programs for therapists. So if you're an MD or an RN or a clinical psychologist or even um, certain types of lawyers that deal with um, family issues um, or even um, clergy members, so priests, um, are able to go through a, what's, it's a psychedelic assisted therapies and research training program where you get a certificate to be a psychedelic therapist. Um, so that's really great. Uh, it's a very competitive program, uh, but they have a course every year and I think they've been running for about five or six years. Uh, and that's in California through the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, there's various psychedelic societies popping up all over the world. There's over 3,000 chapters uh, throughout the planet. It's a great organization trying to build community around psychedelics. Um, there's organizations like Normal, which is uh, the National Organization for Reforming Marijuana Laws. I think that's the right acronym. And um, they're really great at trying to get you know marijuana legalized in the United States. Students for Sensible Drug Policy, so there's chapters at uh, campuses all over the country and they're really trying to uh, make sure that we're creating an evidence base that we can feed to the DEA so that all of our drug laws are based on evidence rather than opinion and propaganda. Um, Erie and other organizations, um, Erie was a, is a nonprofit that started in Oakland. It's, uh, it stands for Entheogenic Research Integration and Education. Uh, there's the Zendo Project, which is a group that provides harm reduction at music festivals. So things like Burning Man or any other kind of transformational festival where people are likely taking psychedelics, the organizers will have a sanctioned place that's sort of like a psychedelic sanctuary where they'll have trained people as sitters so that people that are having a hard time can come and try and make their bad trip um, more meaningful and able to turn it into something positive um, and go and enjoy the rest of their festival. And then, of course, we have here locally the Psychedelic Society of Minneapolis, which I founded in 2018 when I moved here. Um, and then more recently, um, there's the Decriminalized Nature Movement, which is aiming to try and get local city council members to approve resolutions to either defund or um, deprioritize the criminalization of various natural psychedelics like psilocybin mushrooms and ayahuasca admixtures. Um, any boga and things like that so that people can use them in whatever context they want uh, without being arrested or taken to jail or at least 
have it be the lowest priority, so it might be, might be a misdemeanor. So in in Minnesota, um, cannabis is decriminalized, so it's not legal, but you can actually possess a certain amount of it, and if you get caught with it, they'll just take it away and give you a ticket and a fine, um, but you won't get a serious penalty for it. Um, and then we actually have a local chapter here to decriminalize nature as well. Um, so that's exciting. We have a couple representatives here for that. And then um, more, more exciting news more recently, my lab actually just got FDA approval to do a psilocybin study here at the university. So we're gonna get started um, sometime in spring. So FDA approval is the first step. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it took me about a year to get to that point, and then I still need to go through the ethics review um, for the university. That takes another three months, so we're hoping to get started hopefully in the spring. Um, so yeah. So jumping right into uh, sort of the meat of the talk and some of the science. So um, my research overall is trying to understand trauma, and um, what this diagram is showing is sort of a so it's a model, it's a theoretical model of how I view all of these intersecting disorders that I feel have a common root in trauma. And so this includes things like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, anxiety. Um, and when you look at the symptomatology and the diagnostic criteria for some of these disorders, there's quite a bit of overlap um, in how they manifest. And a lot, of these, um, a lot of these conditions also have a lot of similar treatments. Um, that seem to be very um, broad reaching and nonspecific and probably a good indication of why a lot of therapies for these conditions don't work because they're not very precise because we don't fully understand the mechanisms under, underlying some of these diseases. Um, but what I've added onto here is also um, a summary of most of the scientific literature to date. Um, and again, I'm only including scientific literature that has been collected um, after the advent of um, ethics committees. So institutional review boards were invented in the 70s. Um, so all that research in the 50s and 60s wasn't sort of under that criteria for regulation um, for ethics and, and study design. So the FDA wouldn't consider that as evidence. Um, so all of this is sort of an evidence model for the therapeutic potential of various psychoactive and psychedelic compounds um, for all of these different conditions. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into detail about all of them because um, it's not really the focus of this talk. I am, like I said, I'm trying to develop a course on this and I imagine this would be several lectures worth of content to really dig into all of this. But because this talk is about entheogenic plants and fungi, I'm just gonna be focusing on the ones I have highlighted here, which are ayahuasca, ibogaine, and psilocybin. If you wanna dig into this in more detail, uh, you can go to my lab website here, nielsenlab.umn.edu, and I have this on the main page, and there's a list of all of these different indications with links to the original publications that is the evidence for each of these um, references. Okay. Um, so psychedelics, sort of what a lot of the research right now is honing in on is that the objective effects of psychedelics seem to be indicating that it's really impacting the default mode network. So the default mode network is basically a network in your brain that is responsible for essentially your default. So what you're at when you're kind of at rest and not really doing much and kind of what you would always trend towards um, and might be problematic if it's if it's overactive and, and potentially is something that is, is an issue in some of these disorders like depression and PTSD um, and addiction. And this is a really cool figure um, that was made uh, from this publication here in 2014, where they applied machine learning to some um, MRI data, some imaging data of the brain in participants that got either placebo or a psilocybin condition. And each of these little dots here, these circles are different brain regions. And then the lines are like connections between them, functional connections. And you can see in the psilocybin group, there's a lot more connections. And so it seems that entheogens like psilocybin seem to reduce the connectivity within brain ne networks, but boost connectivity between brain networks that don't normally interact. And that might be sort of an explanation of why you experience this, these very kind of chaotic states, because a lot of these brain regions are highly active that normally wouldn't be, so it feels a little abnormal experientially. Some other objective effects are physiological. So a lot of people, when they take um, various entheogens, um, uh, report increased heart rate and blood pressure, um, as well as increased body temperature. And then there's the subjective effects, <laughs> which are the most interesting and sort of the hardest to describe. But uh, uh, most people, I can just tell by your reaction, can relate to. 
Um, so it's, this includes sensory distortions. So we have closed eye imagery, meaning when you close your eyes, you're seeing a lot of visuals. You open your eyes and you see lots of things like distortions in your environments, uh, distortions of distortions of body image, synesthesia. So synesthesia is where your, your senses are sort of mixed up. So you'll see um, sounds or smell colors or something like that. Um, Dreamlike ideation and processing, hypersensitivity to sensory stimuli, unusual thought processes, and childlike sense of wonder and imagination. So some other subjective effects. So this is um, a graph from one of the first papers that was published giving psilocybin to healthy controls. Um, this was done out of the Johns Hopkins Research, uh, Johns Hopkins University by Roland Griffiths, who was a very established pharmacology researcher um, who would research you know, drugs of abuse. And one of his colleagues, Bill Richards at the, t at the time, um, who actually worked with Walter Panke. I don't know how many people are familiar with Walter Panke, but he was involved in the, um, the Good Friday experiment, which is a really famous experiment comparing psilocybin to traditional spiritual experiences um, in, a, in a church setting. Um, and then Rick Doblin for Max, MAPS actually followed up with them about 30 years later uh, to see if that was still a very meaningful experience compared to just some regular um, church mystical experience. Anyway, Bill Richards was um, a protege of Walter Penke, and he was working with Roland Griffiths in the early 2000s, and Roland Griffiths was very interested in meditation, um, and so Bill Richards was like, well, hey, have you ever heard of psilocybin? If you're interested in spiritual experiences, I know of this compound that is a very reliable way to induce mystical experiences. So they designed this study um, in healthy people at Johns Hopkins, where they enrolled people, brought them into the hospital, set them up in this room, gave them psilocybin, and had them have a mystical experience. They just set them on a couch, had them listen to music, put on some eye shades, let their process unfold, and then they ve measured various aspects of, of a mystical experience and, and mood changes. And what they were able to find was that a lot of the people found that um, there was, they rated their experience on psilocybin as one of the top five personally meaningful experiences of their life. And they compared that to even like the birth of their first child or some other substantial things in their life, which is very um, amazing. Um, and they found this uh, result to sustain um, 14 months after they took their experience. So it was a very long lasting um, impact that, ha that they had. And they found um, experiences of internal unity, external unity, transcendence of space and time, sense of sacredness, poetic quality, and a deeply felt positive mood. So entheogens are able to assist in the therapeutic process. So the way that they're currently being used right now in some of the clinical trials are as adjuncts to psychotherapy. So rather than just sending somebody home and giving them a psychedelic, it's done in a, in a controlled clinical setting with two trained sitters at each of their sides. So this is um, a picture from actually the MDMA assisted psychotherapy trial. So this is Michael and Annie Methoffer. They are a couple that have, they've basically been pioneering this MDMA for PTSD research since the early 2010s. I think the first paper was published in 2011. Um, and really the point of this process is to get the person to awaken what they're calling the inner healer, that we might all be struggling with stuff and we can take various drugs or therapies to help us, but ultimately what we're trying to do is, is to initiate our own healing process. And when we have this already, like when you cut yourself, you, you, you form a scar, like that's your inner healer coming in and trying to, to fix the problem. Um, so these sessions, there's a lot of um, preparation involved to get people ready to, to do one of these sessions. And they do integration sessions afterwards to make sure that people can process the experience that they had. Um, and then there's also the therapeutic effect um, where you want to think about things like set and setting. And so set is the mindset of the individual, what's going on in their mind and their life at the moment. And then the setting is the physical location where they're having the experience. And so in the context of the psychedelic assisted therapy, you want to take into account what that set and setting is for both the therapist and the, and the patient. Um, and then they usually have people make sure that they have some intention going into it. Um, and that they're very careful about the environment. Yeah. How do you learn how to, I mean, I kind of like my question, but I'm going to do this with PTSD. Um, what is the information of helping someone through this? Or is there, yeah, who can look to 
Yeah. Um, well, like right now, I mean, all I can say is sitters right now have to be trained in some accredited program. I mean, most of the sitters are people that have some sort of mental health training, whether they have some graduate level, you know, like a master's degree or um, a PhD or a doctorate um, or nurses, somebody with some level of medical training or psychological training. Um, there is training that happens, like I mentioned Zendo earlier, so they'll train people to be sitters at festivals that don't necessarily need to be um, clinical psychologists or, or clinicians, um, but that's more for just sort of like holding space for people. It's not really designed to help somebody through a serious mental health crisis. So if somebody's looking for a sitter for somebody that has depression or PTSD, it's really not appropriate if, you know, to not have somebody that's an actual clinician. Um, at least in the room with some training. And, and it's a little tricky because even somebody that's gone through, you know, graduate level psychological training, it's also different. It's a whole nother level of sitting for somebody in a psychedelic experience and they don't train current clinicians for that. So it's sort of like a, a new field, a new kind of era right now. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, right now, Right. Right. Yeah. So I mean, this is something that's tr we're slowly trying to incorporate it into it. Like I would love to be able to get it incorporated into the residency program here for it to be a course in the medical school program. Um, but right now, I think all they say about psychedelics in medical school is that they're psychotomimetic. Say me. That means that they're mimicking psychosis, which isn't always true or accurate. Um, so I think we just need to change the education model for clinicians. And then also, if we can decriminalize psychedelics, uh, we might be able to have more programs for the broader community to be able to be sitters, qualified sitters. Um, but again, if somebody has a major mental health issue, I think it's really appropriate if there's a trained licensed clinician on board. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Good. So there are some safety concerns and risks with um, entheogenic therapy and experiences. So um, from a lot of the research that was done in the 50s and 60s, like I said, they were trying to use it to understand psychosis. And in some cases, they thought they could treat psychosis. And there were a lot of bad outcomes that came out of that, unfortunately. Um, and not everybody in that has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder agrees with this. There are cases of people that say that psychedelics have helped them, but as a general rule, um, in most of the studies, anyone with a current diagnosis or family history of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or borderline personality disorder, disorder is excluded from these studies where they're, they're giving psychedelics uh, just because of the sort of the neurophysiology of how these disorders manifest. They're very highly involved with the serotonergic and the dopamine system, which a lot of psychedelics will hit on, so you don't want to be exacerbating a system that's already um, overactive. Um, there can be cardiovascular problems, so a lot of people report increased heart rate and blood pressure. So if you already have hypertension or tachycardia, it, it might be dangerous. Um, and so a lot of people with uh, cardiovascular disease are excluded from studies as well. Um, that includes pre-existing heart conditions. Yeah. So usually they try to wean people off SSRIs. I mean, it, usually what will happen, it'll just blunt the effect and it won't be as effective or you may not experience it at all. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And then also uh, MMO. Yeah. So some of those are contraindicated. Yeah. Do you have a question? Um, yeah. Same question. Yeah. So there's a really good, um, also on our website, the Psychedelic Society of Minneapolis website, um, there's a under harm reduction, the harm reduction tab, we have um, a list of, it's like this grid that's put together by this group called Tripsit, and it shows this uh, drug interaction chart of all the different psychedelics and some common prescribed medications, and then it sort of has a color coding from green to being it's an okay interaction to red where it could be potentially fatal. And so it's sort of a good resource to look at um, if you're unsure about what that potential interaction could be. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and then there's also the issue of vulnerability of the patients or participants. Um, there have been instances of sexual assault and exploitation. Unfortunately, uh, this has happened a lot actually in the ayahuasca community, people going down to Peru and there's some shaman who, or, or some other facilitator, doesn't always have to be ayahuasca, that sort of convinces the person that 
you know, sexual activity is, is necessary for their healing. Um, so that's also something to watch out for. And that's why in a lot of the therapeutic settings that are happening um, in these clinical trials, there's always two sitters so that you can always hold each other accountable and it's never just one person watching the participant. So I'm not going to go into the details of the pharmacology of psychedelics. I have a whole um, other lecture that I have online um, on the Psychedelic Society of Minneapolis YouTube channel where I talked in detail about the pharmacology of the different um, major classes of hallucinogens. I just want to point out um, that, you know, the three different structural classes of hallucinogens, we have phenyl, phenylethylamines, um, which is basically things like mescaline, um, tryptamines, which are things like psilocybin and DMT, and then the lysergamides, like LSD. And they all basically exert their main psychoactive effect and the subjective effects um, through this 5-HT2A receptor. So this is a serotonin receptor um, there's many of many serotonin receptors, but they all bind very, very selectively to this one receptor. And if you block binding of that receptor, you can basically stop a psychedelic trip with um, these different compounds. Okay. So just briefly, just in terms of what does that mean in terms of when you activate this receptor, what does that mean and what is the function? Um, so serotonin, so 5-HT basically is an acronym for serotonin. So this is a major neurotransmitter in your brain that's involved in, in a lot of neuronal processes. Um, so when you agonize um, serotonin, you see increased plasticity and increased environmental sensitivity, and it plays a key role in brain development. So this um, image I have to the left is um, PET scans and MRI scans. So MRI scans on the top and PET scans on the bottom in blue. Um, comparing a 21-year-old brain to a 68-year-old brain. And so you have a lot of uh, serotonin in your brain during development, and then as you age, you see less and less serotonin uh, being expressed throughout the brain. And so the expression of serotonin, you can see this is basically uh, the midbrain and the cerebellum, and this would be um, this area that I'm highlighting here that looks yellow is basically where you would see these um, receptors. Um, and then this is the... Um, the level of the basal ganglia, and you see it kind of all around the, the perimeter here. This would be like the cortex, and you see much less of that in this older brain. So um, this type of receptor functioning is really key in develop during developmental periods. So your brain is um, very, very active when you're developing new neuro new connections are forming, and that serotonin is highly involved in that specifically to this receptor. Um, the term agonism basically just means activating. Um, and so it's involved in learning and unlearning and co cognitive flexibility. Um, like I said, being able to activate it um, increases neuroplasticity. Um, it can be involved in system regression. And it's also highly activated uh, in extreme forms of stress as well. So there's these, this whole group of, of practitioners known as aesthetics, I think I'm saying that right, where they basically induce very intense uh, states of suffering in order to induce an altered state of consciousness, which is sort of interesting. But I don't necessarily recommend that as a way to get high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I see it. Well, um, this makes me think of like acetic acid, but aesthetic. Thanks. All right, so let's get into our, our favorite entheogenic compounds. So first I'm going to talk about magic mushrooms or psilocybin because that's the one that's being researched the most. Um, it's, a, it's a really great compound, and, I, and I'm guessing that the reason it's researched the most right now in clinical settings is because, as what some of the other clinical researchers say, it fits very nicely into the workday uh, because it's a short acting. It only lasts for about four to six hours. Uh, so you could have an eight-hour day where you can bring a participant in, give them the drug, and then you can go home at the end of the day, and so can they. Um, uh, just for, for the remainder of the talk, I'm only going to focus on the research from clinical studies. There's a lot of animal research that's been done, um, but I don't necessarily want to focus on that. Um, so I'm basically only focusing on the clinical research and that which has been conducted um, basically since the turn of the century. Um, and what we call the third wave of the psychedelic renaissance. So how many people have heard of this term, the third wave? 
Okay, so it, it basically references the fact that the, the first wave would be all the sort of ancient uses of it, the traditional indigenous uses of psychedelics and entheogens. And the second wave would be the, the hippie counterculture of the 1960s. And then the third wave is basically what we're, we're experiencing now. Um, yeah, and so the reason for that, um, and only focusing on this third wave of evidence, um, is that this is what the FDA would be would consider evidence based on the way that the studies are designed, which I alluded to before. Um, and I'm also not focusing on animal models because I think they're useful to a certain degree, but they're not always good models that uh, have any clinical relevance. A lot of this stuff doesn't translate into what's going on in a human and how do you actually model a trip in an animal? How can you ask an animal if they're having a spiritual experience? You know, um, so. It's interesting for mechanism, but in terms of subjective experience um, and things like that, I really just want to focus on what the, the breadth of research that we have in, um, in humans. Okay, so just a little bit of history about mushrooms. So um, humans have used them for more than 7,000 years. Um, it was first made popularized in sort of modern Western culture by Gordon Wasson, who went down to Mexico and actually experienced psilocybin mushrooms um, the psilocybe mexicana mushrooms in 1970 from Maria Sabina. And he wrote this article that gained a lot of attention. And he act they actually sent a sample to Albert Hoffman at Sandoz Labs, and he was able to extract and isolate psilocybin. And then he patented that as sort of a pharmacological or you know, drug or compound in 1963. Uh, Albert Hoffman, for some of you that don't know, or for those of you who do, he's also the one who basically um, invented LSD. He first synthesized it and first took it. Um, and he has a book about that whole process called My Problem Child. Um, in terms of the pharmacology, like I alluded to, it uh, activates 5 the serotonin receptor, specifically the 5-HT2A receptor. The effects last about three to six hours, and uh, a moderate dose is about two to three and a half grams of dried mushroom. Um, but in the clinical settings right now, what they're actually using is synthetic psilocybin, that will actually just be pure psilocybin. It doesn't have all the other compounds that are in the mushroom. Um, and that'll be about equal to about a 25 milligram dose, which is a pretty intense dose, even though it sounds like a, not a whole lot of compound. And actually, I think uh, somebody was able to synthesize psilocybin and just give that to Maria Sabina, and she felt that it still had the, the spirit of, of psilocybin. Yeah. Similar, similar to It'll, it'll, it's, it's pure psilocybin, and then your body breaks it down to psilocin. Um, so there's uh, several therapeutic uses uh, that are currently being investigated using uh, psilocybin um, and magic mushrooms, mostly the synthetic psilocybin. Um, so this includes addiction. So there's several addiction studies that are happening. The, um, the most prominent is the smoking cessation studies that have been happening out of Johns Hopkins. There's also some preliminary studies looking at uh, problematic alcohol use at NYU. And then recently there's been a study looking at cocaine abuse that's happening in Alabama. Um, they're obviously looking at it to treat depression and then also cluster headaches, existential anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and as sort of an adjunct for palliative care to make people more comfortable with dying. And the cluster headaches one is really interesting. I'm just going to touch on it because I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it too much um, later on. But um, cluster headaches are basically, they call them suicide headaches or suicide migraines. They're very, very intense headaches and almost nothing helps them um, to relieve the pain except for psilocybin and actually LSD for some unknown reason. I don't think we fully understand why they work. Um, so there's this, if anyone you know or you, um, you yourself suffer from cluster headaches, there's a group called Cluster Busters. Um, and it's a group that meets regularly to try and figure out a way to get these things approved. Um, and there are a few clinical trials actually looking at this. But until they're deemed as approved therapies, they're still illegal. Unfortunately, these people with these horrible headaches have to be criminals in order to not suffer, which is unfortunate. OK, so. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of the recent publications that I found on PubMed uh, for clinical studies about psilocybin for a variety of disorders. And again, I'm only focusing on clinical research, and I'm only fo focusing on studies that were looking at some patient population rather than um, healthy controls. There's a lot of scientific studies being done 
um, about psilocybin in healthy people, but um, for the purposes of this lecture, we're, th we're talking about the therapeutic potential, so I'm only focusing on those clinical trials and patients. So I don't expect you to read this, um, but this is just sort of a list from my website. Again, if you go to my website, there's this whole list of all these different articles that have um, sort of an evidence base for this indication. Um, so I lumped together basically based on disorder. So this is LSD and psilocybin for end-of-life anxiety. This is one of the first studies that was done to look at the therapeutic potential. Um, this was first done by Charlie Grobe at, at UCLA in the 90s, or not the 90s, the 2000s. Um, where they basically were looking at people with a terminal cancer diagnosis, and they weren't aiming to try and cure their cancer or save them from dying, but more helping them to come to grips with the fact that they're dying and treat their fear and anxiety and depression around their terminal illness so they could die in peace and so that their family could know that their loved ones were passing um, in a better state. Um, so there's been several studies looking at this, which is really great. Um, the next indication that's in the literature is psilocybin for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so there's been, there was a few studies done back in like 2006, I believe, um, and then not much came of it. Um, and now there's actually a couple of clinical trials happening at Yale right now where they're, they're um, sort of resurrecting this research and trying to look at this so they could actually get this approved as an indication for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, like I said, there's psilocybin for cluster headaches. Uh, psilocybin for addiction. So most of the publications right now are on the um, tobacco and smoking cessation indications. There's been a few pilot studies with some preliminary qualitative data for alcohol use disorder. And I don't believe the cocaine studies have been published, uh, but they're sort of making the conference rounds and I've seen posters about it at various um, scientific meetings. So keep an eye out for that. And then, of course, psilocybin for depression, which is sort of the hot indication right now because that is one that's pretty debilitating. Um, and so there's lots of clinical trials happening looking at depression. There's one at NYU. Um, well, actually, now that, that there's these two um, FDA-approved breakthrough therapy clinical trials, those are multi-site clinical trials. So I think there's probably at least 20 sites that are enrolling participants for this. So again, if you go to our website, I have a list of all of those different um, clinical trials on the Psychedelic Society website. And getting into the clinical trials. So, so most of the clinical trials are registered on a public website called clinicaltrials.gov. So any clinical research that's approved by the FDA has to get registered on clinicaltrials.gov to report their safety and their outcomes. So there's currently 25 completed or active trials um, looking at psilocybin for various disorders. Again, I don't expect you to read this. I know the text is small, um, but it's, there's a whole range of disorders that are being investigated uh, with psilocybin as an adjunct um, to various therapies. So, like I said, alcohol dependence and alcohol use disorder. There's one clinical trial looking at anorexia nervosa, um, <clears throat> studies looking at anxiety in people with terminal cancer, cluster yeah. headaches, depression, um, OCD, and then post-traumatic headache. And then again, if you go to our website, I just have all of these listed down. They're broken down by disorder instead of substance. Um, and then above that, I also have a list of um, there's a lot of clinical trials where they're enrolling, enrolling healthy participants, and so um, for those, I have them broken down by the drug. And this is the website if you were curious to go look at it. And just in case anyone's feverishly taking notes, uh, this will be posted on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to take better notes uh, at a later date. So let's dig into um, some of the conditions that uh, mushrooms have been shown an indication for and some of uh, the promising studies that have been published about that. So let's start with alcohol use disorder. Um, so about 15.1 million people currently uh, meet DSM-5 uh, criteria. So DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for basically um, how psychiatrists and psychologists will diagnose various mental health disorders. 28% um, of American adults have unhealthy alcohol use patterns, and $250 billion um, are spent in healthcare costs for people struggling with alcohol abuse. Yeah? Do you know the definitions of DSM-5 or unhealthy alcohol use? Not off the top of my head. I heard it's pretty low. Yeah, yeah. like four drinks a week. Yeah, it's your whole category. Yeah. 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 I think you have to be symptomatic for either like a month or six months. And then there's like certain, there's like some algorithm depending on how severe your symptoms are, how much it's impacting your life, whether it's impacting work, frequency of use, whether you're driving under the influence. It sounds like you, you have to wake up in the morning and 
one of them is way more than just having ten children. Okay. Yeah. So there's like I ten different things. You, you give three of the eleven criteria. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so when you're talking about this, is this something that, um, I mean, how often do you take it? I mean, how is, is it the same small amounts then that you take every day? Like a, you For know, psilocybin? Chantex for giving up smoking? Yeah. I mean, yeah. How does that well, work? The, the clinical protocols right now are basically two to three sessions, fairly high dose sessions okay. with therapy. Right. Uh, they usually pair it, so for alcohol use disorder, they'll pair it with some approved cognitive behavioral therapy for that's already being used, like motivational enhancement therapy, I think is what they're pairing it with okay. at NYU, so that it's something that already has shown some effectiveness, and then they're using it to enhance that. So they use it to... Going through therapy, they yeah. have someone there, okay. Yeah. And the idea is, you know, it's not something where you would need to take something every day. You have two or three sessions. You try to get at the root of what's causing your symptoms or why you're drinking, especially if it's the motivation enhancement therapy. Like, why are you drinking? Change your motivations. Because it could be... 90% of alcoholics have some kind of mental health disorder. Right. So there might be some underlying trauma or something in their past, and the psilocybin experience might help unearth that, help them confront it, and then they can get involved in some regular psychotherapy practice that then might be more effective to get them to actually quit. Okay. Um, so for alcohol use disorder, current treatments, um, current treatment through your abstinent rates um, are typically done through these 12-step facilities um, like AA. Uh, it seems to only have a 36% success rate. Motivational enhancement therapy, which I just mentioned, which is 27% and cognitive behavioral coping skills, which is 24% success rate, um, and other pharmacological options that are focused on reducing cravings or producing unpleasant physical reactions, but again, those don't always work. Um, so this uh, work is really being pioneered by um, a psychiatrist at NYU named Michael Bobenschutz. Um, so he did a study in 2015 looking at psychedelic-assisted treatment for alcohol dependence. Um, and so their main outcomes were looking at percent heavy drinking days, and they saw a decrease during um, weeks five through 12 of the study. Um, percent heavy drinking days and then percent drinking days in general were decreased, and they saw changes in drinking correlated with mystical quality of the experience. So like I said, um, when they did that initial study where they found that psilocybin could reliably induce this very meaningful mystical experience, they found that the, the participants who had that mystical experience had a high correlation, a very significant correlation with actually reducing their alcohol use. So something about having that, that meaningful experience was able to help them change their drinking habits for whatever reason. Let's see. So the next uh, addiction study is uh, related to tobacco addiction. Um, so there are smoking-related mortalities um, ranging about 5 million people worldwide. Uh, behavioral interventions and pharmacotherapies are not very effective or long-term. And the success rates at six months are less than 35%, so that's not a very good, um, it's not a very good number. So that's, this is just sort of like what, what it looks like in what is tobacco addiction in general without, yeah, what are the current therapies? and the fact that they don't really work that well. And so in a study in 2016, which was published in 2017 by Matt Johnson, also from the Johns Hopkins group, um, they looked at psilocybin-assisted treatment for tobacco addiction, and they saw an 80% abstinence six months post-treatment, 67% abstinence at 12 months post-treatment, and 60% abstinence at a long-term follow-up um, and an average of 30 months post-treatment. So it's a pretty good success rate, especially compared to what we were seeing before. Uh, that was 15 participants, so not very high end, but I think they were still were able. To, the effect sizes were pretty large, uh, so they would get two to three psilocybin sessions between um, 15 week smoking cessation treatment protocols. They'd pair it with cognitive behavioral therapy. Yep. Would we discount these percentages slightly because these people are probably behaving every day here? I mean, potentially they might be self-selecting, but I think these were psilocybin naive. Okay. 
And do you mean motivation to quit motivation smoking? To quit. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that's ultimately a factor. But I think, you know, if you have a true physical dependency, even if you want to quit, you may not be able to. Um, so uh, here's some information about the participants. So they were averaging 19 cigarettes per day. 19? Yeah. I mean, I used to smoke. I, I smoke like a pack a day. That's 20 oh, cigarettes, you know. Um, <laughs> An average, <laughs> so they had an average of six previous quit attempts. So just kind of, just kind of frustrated, probably that they kept trying to quit and they couldn't. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, you know, you know any details about like the, the the way they did the cognitive behavioral therapy, like sort of style of therapy? Yeah, uh, I'm not entirely certain, but I know most of these trials are doing a non-directive approach during the psilocybin session itself. And then during the sort of integration in between is when they do the cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. So they have them talk about the experience and then do the cognitive the CBT with that. And is how 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 similar is that to regular like like could 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 people go get their like psilocybin therapy and then go back to like their regular therapist and get similar results? Like would that do you think that would work? Potentially, but I think you'd want to have the same therapist because there's rapport and trust with the the person that you're doing the whole round with. And so if you're kind of switching that up, the person you're sitting with one person who then your your regular therapist is not going to have any understanding of what you've been through and you can't really talk to them about it. So I think they'd like to maintain the same person. So, I mean theoretically you could. I mean that's sort of what integration is, you know, for sort of the recreational community is that if you're going out and having an experience and then you go and talk about it with your with your doctor or your therapist. And it could be effective. But. I think this is just to sort of minimize variance. It's just to, like I said, these clinical trials are science experiments, so they want to be very tightly controlled uh, to minimize error and variance. Okay. Um, so some other results is they strengthen their belief in their ability to quit. Um, they now act in a long-term, they now act in long-term holistic benefit. They showed reductions in stress regarding quitting smoking. And again, the mystical, whether they had a mystical experience strongly correlated with them being able to quit smoking. And they found positive persisting effects about life, self, mood, and spirituality. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to depression. Um, so just a little bit of background about depression um, in general. So uh, one of the major unfortunate outcomes of depression is suicide, and so it's the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 10 and 34. Uh, it's the leading depression is the leading cause of absenteeism in the workplace, and about 300 pe million people currently suffer from depression, and so it has negative effect on mind, body, and relationships, and usually comes along with other problematic symptoms like substance abuse, cardiovascular complications, loss of appetite, and poor sleep. And the current pharmacological interventions like SSRIs and other therapies are not intended to be long-term, but some of them are. Some people are on SSRIs for many, many years, and it actually becomes more of a problem to get them off of it, and then they just become dependent, and it could be more dangerous to take them off. Um, and they're really focused on, I mean, the current medicines, it seems like, are really focused on symptom management rather than curing. Uh, the depression because I don't think we fully understand what causes depression. So how can we cure something if we don't know what's causing it? Um, but again, there's hope with uh, psilocybin assisted uh, psychotherapy. Uh, so one of the major studies that uh, found some good results from this came out of um, Robin Carhart Harris's group at University College London. Um, so this was psilocybin with psychological support for treatment resistant depression. This was an open label study. Uh, with a six-month follow-up. So open label means that they basically, everyone got the drug or, or they knew who the placebo group was and who the control group was. It wasn't blinded to conditions. So there is sort of that caveat and bias there. Um, so this study was 26 patients, six females, mostly with severe unipolar treatment-resistant major depression. They received two oral doses of psilocybin. Uh, one was 10 milligrams, which would be a low dose, and then one was 25 milligrams, which is that high dose that's equivalent to about three grams of dried mushrooms. And they were given about seven days apart. And this is usually done because you need a bit of a washout uh, between two separate doses because um, you need to kind of replenish your serotonin receptors um, after you've had them all bound with psilocybin. 
Uh, so this is pretty standard in these clinical trial protocols. And then their depressive symptoms were assessed from one week to six months post-treatment. Um, so the results, uh, they basically, because it was open label, it sounds like they didn't have a placebo group. So they were basically um, testing whether they had recovery relative to the own, per the own person's baseline. And they looked at the, as their outcome measure, the quick inventory of depressive symptomatology, which is a self-report. Um, and they found that the scores were significantly reduced at all six post-treatment time points. And of the 19 patients who completed all the assessments, all showed some reduction in depression severity at one week. And these were sustained in the majority for three to five weeks. And fortunately, uh, there was no serious adverse events, so it was deemed to be safe and potentially therapeutic. So, so I think this is just a quote from one of the, the reports that one of the participants uh, said that uh, psilocybin's low toxicity, favorable side effect profile, and putative rapid, oh, this probably wasn't a participant's. <laughs> I think this might just be a quote from the paper. Uh, there's another qualitative study from Rosalind Watts, who's one of the investigators on the study, where she went through and kind of was analyzing the qualitative kind of subjective trip reports of the participants, which is really interesting if you want to go look at that. Anyway, uh, so psilocybin's low toxicity, favorable side effect profile, and putative rapid and enduring antidepressant action could render it at least competitive with currently available treatments for major depression, whose therapeutic actions may be either delayed in the cases of SSRIs and psychotherapy or short-lived, um, such as with ketamine. So with ketamine, it's very fast acting and can kind of reduce symptoms very quickly, but it basically only lasts for about seven days and then symptoms tend to come back. Do you know how they define treatment of depression? Um, I think it's if they've, they've tried like two or three different types of therapy and none of those have reduced their symptoms to a clinically significant degree. I think for spravato, the new intranasal ketamine, mm -hmm. it's, it's failure on like three antidepressants. Okay. Okay. That's, That's their treatment resistant. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So moving on to palliative care. So palliative care is basically sort of like, and correct me if I'm wrong for any clinicians in the room, it's basically making somebody comfortable during the end of life. Um, usually that means just kind of giving them a lot of opiates and just, you know, minimizing their pain and, and just waiting for them to pass. Um, which I guess it, it works, but maybe that's not the best way to go. Um, so um, it seems that like not all suffering is um, physical distress, and the goal of this is to improve the quality of life for the patient and their family as they're transitioning. Um, sounds like there's no FDA-approved pharmacotherapies for cancer-related distress, um, and... There's a delayed onset of clinical improvement, and obviously, if they're giving people these heavy drugs, there's probably significant side effects. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if somebody is just so out of it that they can't function or don't really know what's going on, you know, maybe that's really stressful for the family members or for them. And so, I think trying to find a better workaround for hospice patients would be great. Um, so there was. Um, a study published in 2016, this is again from the NYU group, so that's New York University. It was a randomized controlled trial of 29 participants, 18 females and 11 males. This was a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover design. Uh, so what that means is that each participant got bro both conditions, uh, but then they were blinded to or randomized to who, like, who got what when, um, but they each were able to get the placebo and the active psilocybin drug at various time points during the study. Um, so they were given a single moderate dose of psilocybin in conjunction with psychotherapy. And uh, let's see, there was a rapid and sustained anxiolytic and antidepressant effect um, for at least seven weeks, but potentially as long as eight months. Uh, it decreased their cancer-related existential distress, increased their spiritual well-being and quality of life, and improved attitudes towards death. And... Um, the participant said that their psilocybin experiences were highly meaningful and spiritual. And again, from the study, there were no serious adverse events reported, indicating that it's safe. Single, Single dose, yeah. Milligrams. Probably 25 milligrams. That's sort of the what they're, I mean, because most of these studies are getting it from USONA in Madison, Wisconsin. They're going to be supplying my study with psilocybin, and they basically always give out 25 milligrams, which is that kind of three gram dose. Three dry grams. Three dry grams, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. So, like, the some of the physical side effects of 
psychedelics involve um, you know, difficulty with uh, people's heart conditions and whatnot. Um, people in palliative care measure pretty frail, pretty fragile. Um, did they, I mean, were they able to just give them enough, like, like preemptive care or, like, uh, just, I, I don't know, were, were they concerned at all about, about that because of pretty high doses? And yeah. so... I'm not sure, but if they say they reported no serious adverse events, I mean, they're monitoring for all that. And so if something did happen and they even, like, treated it, they would have marked it as an adverse event. Yeah. Well, there's adverse events and then there's serious adverse events. So the serious, ad so adverse events are acceptable. Those would be things like maybe, a, you know, a moderate increase in blood pressure or something that happened to them, maybe not related to the drug. But a serious adverse event would be something that was potentially critical or life-threatening. And if they're not reporting any of that, then there was nothing that was, like, emergent that came up for the duration of the study, either as a result of the drug or in between drug sessions. So you think like if these people were in hospice setting with constant, you know, um, monitoring professionals, do you think there, there could have been adverse, serious adverse events? It's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think, is it usually an adverse event, especially in hospice, is when you transfer <coughs> From your hospital to a home to a special hospice care home, and it's usually for the last week or your life. So I will say the study wasn't people in hospice. Oh. Okay. These were people that had a terminal illness okay. that either they currently were dying from or they had the illness and they were in remission, okay. and but they still had this sort of existential distress and depression about dying because of the terminal illness, but they didn't have to be in hospice. And that's so important that there's no. no. <laughs> that's what I was like, well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, actually, so this study was done at NYU, and the same protocol was being done at Johns Hopkins, and they both published um, papers at the same time and um, basically were able to replicate each other's findings in two separate cohorts with two different um, clinical trials, which is very exciting and it made a lot of press at the time. Yeah. Um, so going back to Mm -hmm. In the articles that I read about the breakthrough like, therapy that you mentioned, in which, in which major depressive disorder from taking existing depressive disorder, and they were saying that more people suffer from major depressive disorder, do you know if that is accurate? I think so, because it's, it's basically if you've had like symptoms for like one one or six months but it you don't necessarily have to have like a failure to you don't have to have tried all these different treatments and them not worked um, so the study being done by compass pathways the the european pharmaceutical company they're focusing on major depressive disorder whereas the usona study is focusing on treatment resistant depression Yeah. No, that's just too far. Let's see. So this could be wrong, but I found it today. And this was the USONA's notification. And it says treatment of major. Oh, you're right, treatment of major depressive disorder. Okay, you're right then. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks for the clarification. I assume you're one of the medical students here? Uh, I'm a Oh, perfect. Great. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Did you mention how long the state to last the coming out of the Let's see. Seven weeks. But then they say, but potentially as long as nine months, eight months. And actually, there was a study that just came out this week, uh, a follow-up from the NYU study that said uh, four years later they were still having positive benefits. So. Yeah. Okay. So obsessive compulsive disorder. So this was a study done in 2006. Um, about the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of psilocybin in nine patients with OCD. Um, so they did four uh, sessions with different doses. So the acronyms there, VLD is very low dose, LD is low dose, MD is medium dose, and HD is high dose. Um, so uh, for the obsessive compulsive other disorder, uh, they, the criteria was it complicated by presence of suicidality, substance abuse, and depression, and 40 to 60 percent uh, with OCD will not respond to standard therapies. Um, they enrolled nine subjects with an average of three treatment failures. Um, there were no serious adverse events reported. They saw decreases in OCD symptoms um, in all subjects. This was measured with uh, the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And let's see, 67% per maintained a more than 50% decrease in these symptoms. Two reported symptom reductions up to one week after their last psilocybin ingestion. Uh, they found the experience to be psychologically and spiritually enriching, enriching, and again, no serious adverse events were reported. Let's see. Um, and just an interesting side note. So um, how many of you are familiar with Adam Strauss? So he's a comedian who has obsessive compulsive disorder, and he actually was reading these this specific paper back in the early 2000s and decided to what he calls engage in renegade psychopharmacology and to treat himself with magic mushrooms and so he has this whole stand-up show about that whole process and sort of showing what it's like to live with OCD um, and then kind of describe his experiences and I think he had his first experience he was terrified and actually like went to the emergency room because he thought he was dying um, and I think he was dating a psychologist at the time who actually helped facilitate his experience, but it, it really helped um, his symptoms. It didn't cure his OCD. Uh, it's been more of like a symptom management for him, uh, but much better than any of the other treatments he'd ever tried, and he just swears up and down that it has transformed his life, and obviously he's shouting it from a mountaintop in every city that will have him <laughs> give his comedy show. I really hope he comes to Minneapolis someday. Okay, so next we'll move on to Ibogaine. Um, so this is a really interesting one. Um, so first, just a little bit of some of the research that's been done. So a lot of early work was, was done in the 1990s, actually, by um, a researcher named Deborah Mash. She did a lot of animal work and, and clinical trials looking at um, Ibogaine and Noribogaine to treat opioid addiction. And um, this, the research was actually halted because there was actually a really high mortality rate in her studies, and so I think the FDA shut it down. Um, but I think that was more, it wasn't necessarily because of the drug itself, but more um, an indication of the health status of the participants. And there's actually a lot of um, Ibogaine treatment centers and retreat centers throughout the um, country, not the country, but like the world. There's a few in Mexico, I think there's one in Costa Rica. And I think they also kind of have a high mortality rate just because people come to them on their last leg. Their bodies are physically ravaged from opioid addiction, chronic opioid addiction. And so it's an intense experience. I think it lasts something like three days. Um, and so uh, it could be very hard on the body. So I think it's more of an indication of the participant's health status rather than the danger of the drug itself. I will go through that in a minute, yeah. Um, but fortunately, this research was picked up again in the last decade by a researcher named Thomas Kingsley Brown, who's been working with the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, and currently, there's, a, there's two clinical trials uh, currently enrolling participants for opioid use disorder. So Ibogaine is uh, grown from the tabernanth iboga bush. It's native to West Central Africa, and it's used uh, to basically a, a traditional plant medicine 
that is uh, a sacred medicine for the Bowiti religion in Gabon in Africa and used for healing and spiritual purposes. And it's considered a rite of passage into adulthood. They don't necessarily use it as a therapy for addiction. They basically use it to have people come converse with their ancestors. And it's you know sort of like, okay, now you're becoming an adult and you need to go through one of these experiences. Um, but unfortunately with our Western demand uh, for this substance in the recent few decades, there's a sustainability issue happening with people trying to harvest this plant. So its um, benefits for addiction was first discovered by Howard Lotsoff. Um, he found that it was able to interrupt the addiction effects for opioids. So basically what the subjective effects are um, reported is that, or not subjective, but the anecdotal reports are that basically after a single dose or a single experience with Ibogaine, their opioid withdrawals are basically gone. Like they don't go through that whole dangerous withdrawal process that people normally have when they're coming off of heroin. Um, and like I said, there's about 75 to 100 treatment centers worldwide. Um, the pharmacology is not totally well understood. It does have an affinity uh, for the sigma-2 receptor, a moderate affinity for opioid receptors, and it's metabolized in the body to noribogaine. Okay. So regarding toxicology and safety, so like I said, there's been some fatalities from, from this. Uh, some of them are from drug-drug interactions and pre-existing heart conditions. Uh, there's been 19 known deaths after ibogaine, uh, but no evidence for toxic drug effects that are to blame. Um, and these deaths were reported between 1990 and 2008. Um, so the psychological effects, so they're said to be three phases of the ibogaine experience. The first is an awakened dream state, which lasts about four to eight hours. And this is usually accompanied by a visual experience of past memories. Phase two is an evaluative phase that lasts eight to 20 hours. Uh, this is a reflecting on experience. And then there's phase three, which is residual stimulation phase, which can be anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, uh, where the attention shifts back to the external environment. So, yeah. What are the structures responsible for the ALGs? Does this have any ALGs in the Well, some of the pharmacology says it binds to some of the opioid receptors, so potentially, but, but it is, I think, classified as a tryptamine. Mm -hmm. yep. So the no evidence of toxic drug effects in plants, what, what did the studies say they died from? So either having too much of some other drug in their system or heart failure. Heart failure. Yeah. So if like you have a chronic opioid addiction and your body's just really ravaged and your heart's already very weak and then having to go through 72 hours of this experience. So it seems like in general like the, the major danger with the psychedelics is just intensity, like more than your body can physically handle. Like just like so much is happening and your heart just kind of can't take it. Well, yeah, and I think, especially if you're gonna have a lot of panic and anxiety, and if that's gonna increase your blood pressure or your heart rate, that could be dangerous if, if you're prone to that or you have hypertension or cardiovascular disease. Well, do I mean some of the studies don't they like administer like blood pressure medication or something in, in instances where they notice someone's starting to have a panic attack or something? Yeah, I mean you can you would stop. So I have to I had to just put this in my FDA protocol oh. where if we experience if they have a hypertensive crisis, we have to stop the session and then give them like, kind of an emergency blood pressure medication, okay. bring them back down, and then send them to the ER. So. Do you think like that could have been enough from these Ibogaine studies? Potentially, but if they didn't know to look for it. Oh, why wouldn't they? Were these not like under like medical supervision? Uh, they should have been. I'm I'm not quite certain. So these were a while ago. So these were in like the late '90s. Okay. Yeah, and then some of the the treatment centers. So there was one in Mexico that had a lot of deaths, and they closed down. They just weren't handling it well. I don't think they were monitoring them properly. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I can just imagine, like, there's probably things you could do to lower someone's anxiety in a panic attack, right? Like, whether it be, like, you know, acute medication or, I don't know, some other kind of care. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder you know, what they could have done. It seems like 
wasn't necessarily the drugs fault. Like, yeah. All the factors involved. Yeah, like we're going to have pre prescribed anti anxiety and antipsychotics and then some sort of emergency interventions if we need, if they are going to have a yeah. hypertensive crisis or something, yeah. just in case. But most of the studies are reporting that that doesn't happen yeah. because you screen out people that would potentially have that. If they have uncontrolled hypertension, they don't get enrolled. If they have tachycardia or cardiovascular disease, they don't get enrolled. This didn't happen at all in the St. John study. Everything like that came out. Right. Yeah, psilocybin has like 100% like no adverse or serious adverse events in the study so far. Like I said, this was done a, a while ago. You know, this was like almost, or 20 years ago. Well, yeah, so I was just going to add, I don't know if you're trying to Yeah, I would gain or not or nor I would gain. Okay, so then it's not just the other stuff. Yeah, this isn't like people going and, and like having the plants. I think they have well I'm actually not certain how it's prepared in but I mean in like some of these clinical settings. I know because oh, there's that, yeah, yeah, I know there's like the traditional con like preparation, which is probably maybe a little bit more like what you're talking about where there's all these other things, whereas if they're doing it in a clinical study, they're probably extracting some amount and I'm not certain. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what they're doing with any of the the centers. You know, it's not like going to like an ayahuasca retreat. Well, yeah, from what I heard it's just a powder, although they do have a an extraction with like multiple alkaloids in it, so you know. Okay. Uh, which is I would gain plus a bunch of other maybe psychoactive stuff. Like there's not the remarkable It's amazing that nothing can really be so pure. You're just getting that pretty much that, that molecule and that plant. You're mm -hmm. not getting all this other stuff that the baggage is putting around you. It's just kind of a fun, productive kind of thing. It's for its purpose. Well, yeah. the, the Iboga practitioners, we would argue that the plant is a full package. Like, yeah. like there's, there's two schools of thought, like Ibogaine is a single molecule, but then there's the traditional just like I was yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, maybe it's baggage, maybe not, though. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay. Uh, so the the more recent clinical study that was done, um, published in 2018, so this was Thomas Kingsley Brown and Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So um, the objective was to study outcomes following opioid detoxification with Ibogaine in 30 participants. Um, there was a thir 30 people, 25 male, 5 females, and they were about 29 years old on average. Uh, the substances were um, heroin and opioids. Um, and the average duration of opioid use was five and a half years. So the treatment, um, the test dose was three milligrams per kilogram. I'm assuming this is powder. Um, and given when they were exhibiting withdrawal symptoms from their opioid or heroin, um, cessation, and they did a flood dose four times the test dose for two to 12 hours after the test dose, and then a booster dose of three to five megs per keg. And they did this to alleviate withdrawal symptoms or increase the intensity. And so the results was that they saw, um, looking at the subjective opioid withdrawal scale, they saw their scores decrease from 31 to 14, which I'm assuming is a clinically significant reduction in symptoms. Uh, 76.5 hours mean time between baseline and their second score was when they did the recording of this outcome. 
And they saw no significant difference between people with or without comorbid substance use. Uh, they saw improvement in drug use, family, social status, and legal status at 12 months. And the ibogaine effects on opioid withdrawal symptoms appear to be comparable to methadone, um, where they directly compared ibogaine versus methadone treatment. And then the treatment effects were extending up to 12 months in a subset of the individuals. Uh, from a qualitative perspective, um, so some of the numbers cannot necessarily seem so meaningful. So um, Ibogaine state of consciousness produced insights and meaning, uh, diminished post-treatment drug cravings. Uh, said you could safely say that Iboga will give an opioid addict several months to half a year of freedom from cravings and an expanded awareness. This gives the user a period of time in which to get his or her life together and learn to face things straightforwardly, directly, and honestly. And Iboga will not work for you will not do the work for you, however, it will help you do your own work. And with this study, they saw no clinically significant cardiovascular or other medical events occurred, but they learned from those first trials that were done by Deborah Mash, which is fortunate. Um, this is just a fun little slide somebody put in here about the SAMHSA. So SAMHSA um, is sort of like a mental health um, repository. Um, and their working definition of recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. So the last um, entheogen I'm going to talk about is ayahuasca. So there hasn't, there's been a lot of research on ayahuasca in terms of mechanisms and how it affects the brain, uh, but not a whole lot of treatment studies looking at ayahuasca. Um, and I'll go into the reason for that in a minute. Um, so there's been a few papers um, and studies researching it for addiction um, as well as depression. Uh, most of this work is being done out of the country in Brazil and in Spain. Uh, it's very hard to do ayahuasca research here in the United States. Um, but a little bit of background about ayahuasca. So it's used by indigenous tribes in the Amazon, like South America and Brazil. Um, it's an entheogenic brew or tea, so it's an admixture of two different plants. One plant is the Banisteriopsis copy vine which uh, I'll go into that in a minute, and a psycho, Psychotria viridis leaf, which contains dimethyltryptamine. Um, so actually, there's a lot of plants that contain dimethyltryptamine, but in the Amazon, these two plants grow in general proximity to each other. They don't grow right next to each other. I'm not sure historically how uh, it was found that these two plants would work so well together, but according to some shamanic anecdotes, shaman's anecdotes, the, the plant medicines told them about them and told them where to find them and how to mix them, and the rest is history. Um, so the Banisteriopsis copy vine actually contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor uh, because dimethyltryptamine, while it's one of the most potent psychedelics that we have um, in, in the world, and it's actually a neurotransmitter in your own brain, um, it's not orally active, so if you try to ingest it, you're not going to experience it because it's broken down by mono monoamine oxidases. So fortunately, this vine has an inhibitor to that enzyme so that when you take them together in this tea that is made, it becomes orally active and you have this very intense, long-lasting experience. Otherwise, people smoke DMT, they extract it, and then it lasts for like 5 to 20 minutes, and it's a very intense experience, but it's very short-lived and kind of chaotic and um, disorienting. So I've heard... Um, okay, um, so dimethyltryptamine is, again, it's another one of these tryptamines that's activating these major 5-HT2A and 1A receptors. Um, its effects include intensified emotions, heightened visual and auditory sensations, and the duration of effects usually lasts around four hours. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, Jordi Riba, uh, who's a clinical researcher in Spain who's been researching ayahuasca for 20 years. And so a lot of what we know about how ayahuasca affects the brain, um, mostly in healthy people, has been done by him. So if you're curious to learn everything you could ever possibly know about ayahuasca's impact um, on um, neurological processes, I recommend looking up his work. Let's see. So some of the therapeutic uses that are being investigated right now, like I said, are addiction and depression. There's one study, I think I mislabeled this, it's actually just eating disorders, so they're looking at things like bulimia and anorexia, um, but that and then its indication potentially for post-traumatic stress disorder are kind of in the early phases and the evidence is still emerging, so I don't want to make any strong conclusions about whether these things are potential treatments for those because they're still being investigated. <laughs> 
So um, one of the first studies looking at um, addiction treatment um, with ayahuasca as addiction treatment uh, was published in 2013 by Gerald Thomas and colleagues. Um, so they were working with addiction and stress retreat. So it was basically these people that were already going to a retreat um, to try and treat their addiction. Um, and they basically just followed them and observed them and monitored them afterwards. And they enrolled 12 participants from First Nations Band in Canada. So this was four days of group counseling and two ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, so these were participants from the First Nations Band that had intergenerational trauma, and they stayed in their traditional community ceremonial space to take ayahuasca. So day one involved being greeted with songs of welcome, strength, and courage, and then day two was the ayahuasca session, uh, followed by group therapy reflecting on addictions the next morning, and then they shared empathy and understanding, and then they were doing breathing and meditation exercises afterwards. So again, this study also reported no serious adverse health or psychological consequences. Uh, they reported enhanced mindfulness, personal empowerment and hopefulness, quality of life and increased connection with self, nature, others, and spirit. Uh, they saw reductions in problematic cocaine use and tobacco and alcohol use was also declined from their baseline reports. Um, so a qualitative report from this study with the last experience with ayahuasca, I really faced myself like my fear, my anger, I wish I was introduced to it 20 years ago. It could have saved me a lot of time and trouble. The retreat affected my life and giving me another chance at life rather than being stuck in my addiction and just living for my addiction. It really opened my eyes. It was like I was shut down before drinking ayahuasca and now my mind and my eyes were, wide, were shut down to everything after the retreat. I felt like a brick was lifted off of my shoulders and I was just feeling free. This is kind of a common anecdote with psychedelic therapy in general. People seem to claim that it's like getting 10 years of psychotherapy in a single session, which is pretty, pretty powerful statement and pretty um, commonly reported. Uh, and so the last thing I'm going to talk about is ayahuasca for PTSD kind of doing a little shameless self-plug because actually I'm the only one that's been researching ayahuasca for PTSD. Um, I first became aware of ayahuasca in 2010 after I finished my PhD. Um, I had a little bit of trauma myself. I did a lot of animal work in grad school and it was just really hard for me to get over that. And I had gone through a really painful divorce and I wasn't sure I really wanted to stay in science. And I just sort of serendipitously found myself at this retreat center um, in Peru with a bunch of war veterans that were down there to treat their PTSD. Um, and yeah, so uh, this is just me and I'm not going to plug this, but it was just a documentary um, about ayahuasca for PTSD back in 2012. That's me sitting there at the base of the temple. Um, and so when I went down there, I kind of was thinking of leaving science and I wasn't sure I wanted to stay in the field and what I was going to do with my career. And, um, but when I went down there, I saw the, the sort of the transformation of all these veterans with PTSD and seeing them soften up over the week. And it inspired me to come back and see if I could somehow research ayahuasca to treat PTSD um, in the US. And so I immediately came back to the US, started a postdoctoral position in San Francisco and reached out to the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies to see how I could become an ayahuasca researcher and they said they actually didn't have any ayahuasca research happening and I should just I should just do it. So um, they were really supportive in trying to help me kind of get involved into the psychedelic research community. And so the first thing I did was publish this sort of hypothesis about why I thought ayahuasca would be a good treatment for PTSD. And I did this with a psychiatric nurse practitioner that I was friends with um, in San Francisco who co-authored this with me. Um, and then after that, we basically were making the rounds, giving talks at various psychedelic conferences about the idea and some of the results from preliminary study we were doing. And so that was interesting just to get connected. But um, in 2014, we published a book chapter on some of the trip reports that those veterans that I was down in Peru with shared with me. Um, it was only three people, so a very small sample size. But um, the thing that stuck out most was that they were referring to this as medicine and that it really was kind of helping them with their PTSD. And um, not really having any formal data on the topic, I basically looked at Arrowhead, um, which is, how many people are familiar with Arrowhead? Okay, so Arrowhead is a, it's basically like a collection of trip reports um, that has been, it's been online since like the 90s. It's a really great resource and it categorizes um, 
various types of trips, you know, based on some of these categories I have here and broken down by drug. So I basically just looked up trip types by ayahuasca experience. And um, what I found was that, you know, although a lot of people were reporting having difficult experiences with ayahuasca, most of them considered them also to be glowing or mystical experiences. And so what a lot of people say in, in the psychedelic community is that a difficult experience is not necessarily a bad experience. A difficult experience could be one of the most transformational and healing experiences of your life. It's just making sure you can actually get through it and derive meaning from it. Um, so I think that's what this is representing here. But as I started to talk about this and give more lectures about it, at the time there was just a lot of press about it and I felt like it was being overhyped with not enough data and a lot of people were thinking ayahuasca was this magic bullet cure. And unfortunately there was all this positive press that was followed by a lot of negative press. There was a lot of harms being done. There were people that were going down to the Amazon and dying for whatever reason. Not sure if it was because of the ayahuasca. I don't think it was. I think it could have been you know, unethical shamans or various other things that happened. Um, it, but it was enough that it was making me start to feel really uncomfortable with the way that the press portrays sort of the, the therapeutic potential of some of these things without enough evidence because it's clickbait and it's really exciting. Um, and I also think very dangerous. And so um, I spent a while actually trying to get a clinical trial approved by the FDA to look at ayahuasca for PTSD. And it's really hard to get a plant admixture through FDA because, I mean, they have a botanical division, but it's such a complicated mix of, of, of plant material and trying to standardize the active ingredients. And I spent like four years just trying to navigate that process without success and getting really frustrated as all this other media attention was building. And so um, I decided after seeing all the sort of survey studies coming out of Hopkins, I was like, why don't I just do a survey study? If everyone's reporting that this is fixing their whole life and it's so therapeutically beneficial to them, uh, let's see if that's actually true. So I designed this anonymous survey with the help and funding of MAPS. Um, this is actually still ongoing um, and basically there's some kind of limitations to it. It's an anonymous online survey. It's retrospective and cross-sectional. So we're basically just asking people to think back on their ayahuasca experience. Did it help them with their PTSD or not? Um, so there's variability in set and setting of the participants that I couldn't control for. And we limited the participants to English speaking, which sort of takes out all of the people from South America that are doing this in sort of indigenous and natural contexts. But um, so this is just sort of the data we have to work with. I had a final cohort um, after our, my exclusion criteria of about 47% of the cohort having um, criteria for PTSD. Um, and what I have um, in press right now, there's a book coming out called Ayahuasca Healing and Science. This is a qualitative assessment of basically the trip reports from these people. Um, and I basically was just asking whether they found it to be dangerous or helpful. Um, and then I broke that down based on whether they had a current past or no diagnosis of PTSD. And for the most part, so the black bars are whether they answered yes to that question of it being helpful or dangerous in the white or whether they said no. Um, and so you see most people are saying that they don't find it to be dangerous. So the white bars say that they're not dangerous, although there are some people that do claim it that it was, it felt dangerous to them, but most people found it to be very helpful. Um, but we do see that there are, you know, quite a bit of people with, um, in the PTSD category that found it to be dangerous. Um, and then trying to analyze um, sort of who actually was providing additional response. So that was just sort of yes, no, unsure. Do you think it's dangerous? But then I actually asked them to write about their subjective experience and why they felt it to be dangerous. And so not everybody felt comfortable submitting any content to that. But it was interesting because I found, to my surprise, that the people that had a history of PTSD were more likely to describe the dangerous experiences that they had compared to the people that didn't have a history with PTSD. So maybe they felt compelled to share um, what their experience was. Um, and then myself and two other people, we independently read all these different trip reports and kind of tried to identify themes that we saw emerged in the um, in their trip reports about what they found to be dangerous and this is just a representation of that and just for time's sake I'll just kind of highlight that that sort of the main thing that popped out with um, the group of people that had a history of PTSD was that they they reported more physical complications as being things that they found to be dangerous so like I said sometimes these psychedelics will cause 
blood pressure issues or um, cardiovascular complications. And people with chronic PTSD, all like a lot of times, will have cardiovascular disease. So this could be a potential problem for people with PTSD seeking this out and something to be aware of. Um, and this is, again, just kind of highlighting that. Um, but some of the other things that people found to be dangerous was some of these ceremonies were just you know overcrowded, too many people, not enough support. There was a lot of panic um, and fearfulness about kind of not having control of the situation. They're in the, having this intense psychedelic experience while also suffering from trauma. Um, a lot of these, um, you know, sort of shamanic settings in the jungle don't really have Western medical support. So a lot of them found that to be a little dangerous. Um, and there were some things that were more cultural. So like a lot of people didn't like the fact that the shamans were also intoxicated, but that's actually very common practice where the shaman also takes it. So that was kind of interesting, but you know, I guess they, they hoped that the person would be sober that was watching them. Um, there was some mistresses of, of sexual abuse. Um, not all these centers actually had a process for integration or follow-up, um, which people found problematic because some people kind of felt that maybe they unearthed some stuff about their trauma and then they couldn't really process it and they didn't have anyone to talk to about it and there was no follow-up on that. And then some of the the churches, the like the Santa Daime Church, um, actually have very strict gender roles and some of it's very like religious and like Catholic has like Catholicism built into it, and that was very off-putting to some people. Um, but, you know, that wasn't the sort of the dominant response, even though I did want to highlight the dangers and what they were and what was unique to people with PTSD. The majority of the responses were very positive, and people found this to be a very helpful experience and to be very useful um, to help them manage and deal with their PTSD and their trauma. Um, and so this included um, things that things that they found helpful were just knowing that the shaman was experienced, that they felt that this person was capable of, of guiding them through their process, um, having support mechanisms in place. They really liked the aspect of the ritual, um, having various comforts with them that were personal to them, um, and being in a supportive and like-minded group. So I think, again, this gets to set and setting and being with, because a lot of ayahuasca ceremonies are done in group sit settings. And if you're just going to some random ayahuasca retreat with a bunch of strangers and you already have trust issues because you have PTSD, that could be really problematic. So, so I, I noticed with the veterans that I was with, they felt this camaraderie being with other veterans. So I think that was kind of important, like just having like-minded people or people from your community in the ceremonial space if you're gonna be doing these group situations is helpful. All right, well, that was all qualitative stuff. I'm not going to go into all of the numbers that I've generated from this study because this is currently under revision um, to try and publish. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, I'll just say it's forthcoming. <laughs> um, so what's next on the horizon for all of this? So like I alluded to, we're actually trying to decriminalize um, psychedelic plants and fungi here in Minneapolis. Um, so we've started this group, Decriminalize Nature Minneapolis, and we're working to promote the wellness of individuals through decriminalization of entheogenic plants and fungi, uh, which involves removing criminal, criminal penalties for these healing substances and hoping that it will improve the physical, mental, and emotional health of our community. Uh, we're a grassroots organization focused on the responsible use of entheogenic plants and fungi. Um, we want to inform residents of Minneapolis, as well as city officials and law enforcement about their healing potential. Uh, we hope to have more educational campaigns to talk to people that might be kind of skeptical about some of these plants and their therapeutic potential, and hopefully uh, being able to encourage sensible evidence-based drug policy, and then also creating a community of support so that if it does become decriminalized, we will have a group of people to sort of help pe help guide people through the process of how to engage responsibly with these substances and the experiences that they induce. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to our website. And like I said, we're starting a new psilocybin study here at the university. Um, so. It's just sort of the official letter from the FDA saying they received it, and I'm still waiting for the actual physical letter, but they sent their approval via email on January 2nd, so that was exciting. And until I can get an NIH grant to fund psychedelic research, which no one has really gotten before uh, because Congress has a ban on funding <laughs> Schedule One drugs for therapeutic purposes, um, all of this work is basically funded through grassroots, grassroots fundraising um, or through nonprofit organizations like MAPS or Hefter. Um, so we do have a 
a fund set up through the University of Minnesota Foundation for tax deductible donations if you or anyone you know wants to help support this research. Um, and you can find the link to that again on the Psychedelic MPLS website under the research tab. And I just want to um, acknowledge Eric Peterson and Alex Larson. So they're part of our therapist group in the Psychedelic Society. Um, they were really instrumental in creating a lot of these talks or a lot of these slides um, because we're basically in part of our decriminalized nature campaign and just trying to educate the public in general about the responsible use of these compounds. Um, we really want to start talking to more clinical groups and talking to doctors and therapists and getting people to support this and, and hopefully getting it incorporated into medical school education and getting um, support. So like at the end of the month, we're going to be talking to the palliative care group at Alina and talking about some of this stuff. So hopefully that'll be interesting. And I think there's other um, clinical groups that are interested. I don't know, Chris, you mentioned one. It's okay, uh, but there, you know, we're basically just reaching out to every clinician group we can find and trying to see if we can, you know, turn the tide more and more. And you know, even within my own department in psychiatry, I've been met with a lot of resistance about doing this kind of work. But slowly, people are starting to come around as they see the research coming out. They see FDA taking notice and granting breakthrough therapy designations. So it's just sort of like you know, changing people's minds one at a time <laughs> um, until it's acceptable and it's not stigmatized and it's available for everyone. So thanks for your attention and I'll take any questions. Yeah. If the political climate in my community has gone down and, and what kind of reaction are you getting from that? Uh, so far, it's been pretty positive, actually. There's just, um, there's just certain like, um, I was trying to use Fairview recruiting system, like their mailing system, to contact potential participants, and they were very mad. They were not happy with that approach, so I'm not allowed to use that system. <laughs> so I was in a room of 30 admins, and it didn't go well. So, but that was the most hostile encounter I've had. For the most part, you know, when you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, it hasn't gone too badly. And I think it's, it's about the delivery, and it's about knowing your audience and, and pitching the right topic under um, a framework that they can relate to and kind of meeting them where they're at rather than just spouting a bunch of stats and speaking about how great psychedelics are. You know, I think that doesn't land well with someone that is on the fence or skeptical about it. <laughs>